Hello beautiful people, my name is Veronica Winters, I'm the host of Hooked on Art podcast and uh, today I'm going to introduce you to a super talented colored pencil artist Megan Siter, who is a very accomplished American artist. She is represented by two art galleries and participates in many art shows today. She is the winner of uh, several top uh, art awards, including first place in the Color Pencil Magazine annual art competition, first place in Southwest Art Artistic Excellence competition, uh, best in show in the UK Color Pencil Society exhibition, Fine Art Connoisseur Award and many many more. In this podcast episode uh, she is going to share her colored pencil techniques. She's going to give us ideas how to do art marketing effectively, how to promote the art and be uh, successful creating beautiful artworks. <laughs> nice to see you Megan. Thank you. <laughs> um, I appreciate you coming to my show. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to be on. You know, the, re the reason why I invited you is because of your art, because it's so beautiful, realistic, and there is a unique spin to a very common theme, which is still life painting. I am like super interested uh, to learn about your colored pencil technique. Uh, before we do that, uh, could you uh, describe your art to someone who ha has never seen it before. Yeah, it's um, so they're kind of just what you said. They're hyper realistic colored pencil still life drawings, um, usually with a minimal background, um, so as to shine light on the um, the subject itself. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly botanical. I do some like fruits and vegetables and things like that. Um, but right now I'm on a flower kick. Um, so, and I, yeah, I work with colored pencils. I sometimes use pastels in the background just to create, um, not a lot of, uh, information, but just, uh, atmosphere. So maybe just a simple gradient or, um, like on a table with a dramatic background or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I know that you can, you combine, uh, pen pastels, right? Yes. How do you combine them with colored pencils? Because, you know, I used to do soft pastels mm -hmm. uh, on their own, but I've never combined two mediums together. So. so the trick is I don't actually really combine them. I sort of just use them side by side because mm -hmm. when you draw with colored pencil on top of a lot of pastel, you're kind of just carving away the pastel. You know, the pastel gets thick on the paper and it mm -hmm. doesn't you can do it with like a light layer of pastel, but it's hard to actually meld the two I found. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I'll start with pastel. Um, I use something called Frisket film. Um, and so I'll do a sketch, just say I'm drawing like a dahlia. I'll sketch out the dahlia on tracing paper and then I'll transfer that sketch onto the um, Frisket film and cut it out really carefully so that I can block off the area of the paper where the dahlia will be. And that way I can use a sponge uh, with a pan pastel and cover the paper entirely with a single color or a gradient, but I don't have to worry about um, working around a sketch. I can just make a really smooth, beautiful gradient. And then I peel off the frisket film and then where the frisket film was to draw the dahlia, I do that in a hundred percent colored pencil or with sometimes with a um, watercolor base first. So I'm not actually like mixing the two. I'm just kind mm -hmm. of using them side by side. Okay, it it, may, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but like, what do you do about the edges? Because you need some of the edges to recede in space more. So how yeah. do you blend it? So you can go back in after I've. Um, you can use the actually the pencils. You know, you work with I work with sharp pencils, and I can kind of carve out some of the pastel, but it won't. Especially if I'm working with a black or a dark background, mm -hmm. if I use the pencil against the edge and sort of carve out that pastel, it'll create a sort of a soft edge. Sometimes I also use pastel pencils, and um, or I use like a small uh, blender, like a sponge or. Um, just some sort of blending stick and I can soften the edges. 
so the drawing doesn't look dirty when you blend the colored pencil into the pasta? It's so slight, it's just on the very edge. So I'm not pulling a lot of the pastel into the drawing or pushing a lot of the pencil into the pastel area. It's just along the edge, just enough to feather the edge if I need to, so that it's not a really sharp um, focused point. Um, so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't get dirty. I, I do it really carefully so that uh -huh. you can too much of the pastel. Uh -huh. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, it works well if you have, if you're, you know, do it precisely. Yeah. So do you fix your pastel layer or no? I don't. I, I used to use fixative mm -hmm. um, and then I had some issues with the fixative spitting, you know, and leaving tiny little dots on the drawing. Um, and I know it changes the color slightly. And I, um, there's a pastel artist that I love, Daniel Massad, um, mm -hmm. and he does not use fixative. And I saw that what he does is he'll tape his drawing to a drawing board and flip it upside down and slap the back of the drawing board so the excess pastel falls off. Mm -hmm. And I've never had an issue with any of the pastel shifting. Um, I also, when I use tape around the edges, I'll use like a, a hand vacuum to, cause you know, the pastel mm -hmm. will gather along the edge of the tape and I'll use a hand vacuum to get rid of that. And then I usually mat them with a white, you know, on top of a white mat board and I ship them and I've never had any trouble with the pastel shifting without um, fixative. Interesting. So you don't even use the final fixative like oh, ov no. over your entire, not, not, not wow. Yeah. So I also, <laughs> I work on sanded pastel paper and I don't often burnish. Um, so those two things combined help a lot because I don't get a ton of wax bloom. And I know that a lot of pencil artists use the fixative to help combat the wax bloom, but with that technique, there's not a ton of wax bloom that happens. So I don't need to protect against that. I see. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So uh, how are pen pastels different from soft pastels? Is there a difference at all or no? Um, I think applying the soft pastel like right on the page they'll go on thicker and maybe mm -hmm. more vibrant at first but um when i'm using pan pastel it's um just in case nobody's seen it it's just this little pan and then mm -hmm. i use a sponge so i'm not making any direct marks like or lines on my drawing paper instead i have a sponge and i'm kind of smoothing it on like you would put makeup on your face or something like that. And so there's no, um, it just goes on very smoothly and it's a little bit easier for me to create a very smooth gradient. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm usually using it to cover a wide space. And so it's um, like I use these kind of big sponges. Uh, mm -hmm. So instead of having a small surface where you're drawing with the pastel stick, I have a, a larger surface, which kind of helps. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what makes your art uh, different because uh, the first time I saw it, I saw that effect. Uh, your background was very separate and clean yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in comparison to your subject. Yeah. And I think uh, that felt so different. Yeah. Um, I like the effect a lot. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I used to, um, when I was in college, I was studying portraits and I, um, you know, I just love to really put the attention on the person's face or even figures. And there's mm -hmm. not a lot of information in the background. And I liked that effect. So I just kind of took that effect and transferred it over to the still life where there's not a lot of information because I really want the focus to be on that subject. And so that's kind of how it came to be that my um, backgrounds are so stark. Um, and I think it really draws you into just the subject alone. So why did you choose um, still life um, as opposed to portraits? I, well, I think I realized I wasn't going to have access to um, models that would sit for hours and hours. And when I was in college, I was only working from life. And so um, I picked up colored pencil. I was doing mostly charcoal or graphite, mm -hmm. really mostly charcoal and black and white. And then I discovered colored pencil um, in a class where I was working on still life. And the colored pencil was taking me a really long time, but I mm -hmm. loved the medium. And I also loved that you that I had um, control over setting up 
an actual still life and figuring out the lighting. Um, I think there's a little bit more, um, it's a longer process with colored pencil and still life seems like a better, um, a better way to go rather than asking someone to sit for me for 50 hours or whatever. <laughs> and, yeah. and then I just kind of fell in love with still life and colored pencil combined. And um, recently I've been missing working with portraits and figures. So I found these, um, these, vases that look like women's you know they're they almost mm -hmm. look like a sculpture of women's bodies and that kind of mm -hmm. satisfies that craving uh to go mm -hmm. back to figures yeah what, what college did you go to i went to mica it's maryland institute college of art in baltimore for your bachelor's degree yeah so i got a bachelor's degree in general fine arts um so i had started at a liberal art school and I was taking all art classes. So I just decided to transfer to a, an all art college. And then I majored in general fine art so that I could experiment. So I was taking sculpture, oil painting, um, graphic design, photography. I was taking all the classes to kind of figure out which direction to go, a portrait, a portrait class, a figure class. Um, and then there was the one class where I discovered colored pencils. And then for the rest of my time there, I was kind of trying to figure out how to use them and what technique to do and what paper to use and um, sort of fell in love with them and then went with that for my career. I see. So you started, you found colored pencils in college. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think of college education? Was it worthwhile? Like sometimes I get this question, is it worth studying in college or not? Like what's your experience? Mine was um, initially I went to a liberal arts college because I didn't want to have such a focused education. I had heard that there's not a lot in art colleges other than art. Like there's no business, there's no mm -hmm. philosophy or psychology or anything else that I might be interested in. So I was at that school for a year and a half. And again, I kind of, I think I kind of like um, got a lot out of their art program and then thought I should just go to an art college because really that's what I'm going to do instead of resisting and taking all these other classes. So when I got to MICA, I was grateful to go there for all of the resources that they had. Um, like, again, I was able to take all kinds of interesting classes and it helps to understand like how oil painters work and how acrylics work and then to um, translate that to sculpture and then you're working in 3D. I think all of those things help your brain mm -hmm. and your perspective with whatever um, medium you end up choosing. And so for me, it was worth it for the experimentation and the resources they had, you know, all the wheels and the design, you know, everything. So I appreciated that. I think I would have liked to, I, try, I was trying to take business classes, but they really didn't have any. And Mm -hmm. To become a professional artist, you do need to really know about business and marketing and those kinds of things. Um, but I, I'm happy with the experience. Uh, when was that? Like, what year? Uh, yeah, I graduated in 2009. Nine. Well, I, I wonder what's happening now. Like, if colleges are considering, you know, offering business classes or not. Because this yeah. is like really important. I don't know why it's skipped. So important. It's it's really like it's a, really a challenge to make it as a professional artist. If all you like, there's so many really talented people who don't have the resources or the you know just don't know how to like market themselves. And so it's what can you do with your art if you can't get it out into the world? You know. <laughs> Please take a moment to rate my podcast on Apple and Spotify if you feel so inclined. Thank you so much. Art marketing is, uh, it was really different when I graduated because I mean, like social media wasn't a huge thing. I think mm -hmm. Instagram wasn't invented yet. There was like Facebook. Um, and so it was a lot more face-to-face, uh, -face, like handing out business cards and joining organizations like the Colored Pencil Society of America like just being in galleries and in spaces and meeting people. And now 100% of my marketing is done on social media. And then also through the galleries that represent me, they do a lot of the marketing for me. But um, through Instagram, like I'm able to reach a huge audience of people that I wouldn't have been able to 10 years ago. 
um, and also meet fellow artists and um, see other people's techniques and share my techniques and share what I'm up to and little videos of how I do what I do. So it's a really, it's time consuming um, to mm -hmm. create the following and to keep up with it. But I think it's a really valuable resource if you're willing to put the effort in. How, how did you create the following on Instagram? What did you do? Um, I, I watched a class actually that is called Insights for Artists and it was mm -hmm. really helpful. It's this woman, Dina Brodsky, who talks about, um, I watched it too. Yeah. It was so helpful, right? Yeah. The, um, Instagram algorithm and how to present your work. And for a while I was, um, I was still in the gallery mentality. So I was showing just like regular images of my finished artwork. And she sort of explains that you need to show your process and open up a little bit and show more about yourself. Like what people are interested in seeing is the behind the scenes stuff, not just the finished image. So kind of started working on that. And um, like sometimes if a, a post starts trending, other people will repost it, which is really helpful, like Colored Pencil Masters or one of those accounts. Um, mm -hmm. And then it sort of organically grows. Like once you kind of get on a roll, you can keep rolling. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think uh, um, Instagram keeps changing so much that it's not as easy as it used to be. No. Yeah. Especially so you can, yeah, you can keep uh, posting, but um, it's just not the same reach as it used to be. No, because for a while, I think they shifted their focus to videos and reels because they were competing mm -hmm. with TikTok and now they've kind of switched back to the images. So just really staying on top of like what Instagram is trying to push and then pushing that yourself, like mm -hmm. using, plugging your art into that, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of work to do that kind of marketing, but it's free marketing and it reaches mm -hmm. a wider audience. So I think for me, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth for any artist. Yeah, <laughs> I, and that class is really, really helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, how did you get gallery representation? What did you do? Um, one, so I have two galleries that represent me. I think, um, and I've had a few others that have asked, but I, I just don't produce that much work. And I think the way that they find me is through publications, like, um, getting published is really useful um, because if you're in a magazine, like a, especially ones that collectors and galleries look at, they see your work and they think it's a good match for their gallery and they'll reach out to you. Um, so one gallery, I think so, must have seen me in a, a publication or um, like what, another gallery. I'm sorry, what publication? Like American Art Collector? Um, I think that they, they must have seen me in Fine Art Connoisseur, but I've been, okay. yeah, like International Artist Magazine is another good one, but that one's mm -hmm. kind of more marketed toward artists and less toward collectors. Mm -hmm. um, I think they may have seen me in the Fine Art Connoisseur or um, Southwest Art, actually. It, it is mm -hmm. a Southwest Art Gallery, so they might have seen me in that that one. I see. Um, and then the other gallery that represents me was from a contact I made when I was right out of college and doing that face-to-face -face, um, meeting people and handing out my business card. I met... Um, this man who's an amazing, uh, he's an artist in San Francisco, but he also connects artists with other artists and galleries with artists. And he's one of those super connectors. And so he connected me with this gallery and they've been representing me for um, three or four years. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's good for artists to hear that it's not just uh, creating beautiful art. You have to network uh, to be successful financially. Yeah. Yeah, and all these organizations really do help, like American Women Artists, Colored Pencil Society of America, the UK, Color, like all these organizations have resources for artists to connect um, with like sponsors or other artists or, you know, it, um, it's really helpful to stay connected. And mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Um, how do you do the outreach? How do you try to network? Um, what, what do you mean by um, 
looking at the resources like what do you do <laughs> revisit the information yeah one thing right when i was starting out i used to just find other artists that i would admire that had <laughs> established careers already and i would sort of go on their website and just mm -hmm. see what they were doing what galleries are they at what kind of um like awards have they won and what are those competitions and then i would sort of get in line with those like oh i didn't know that um, International Artist Magazine has a monthly competition. And if you win the competition, you get in the magazine. If you get in the top three, you get into American Art Collector. So that's a great way to do it is to just find uh, artists that you admire and see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Through Colored Pencil Society of America, I think they have, I mean, they have their annual exhibit and that's sponsored by a lot of great mm -hmm. uh, art companies. Um, but they just have um, an American Women Artist too. They have resources all over their um, website, just depending on what you're looking for to connect you with um, other artists or they have their own mar marketing platforms and you can contact their marketing director and say, hey, I have a show coming up. Can you publish this on Instagram? Or there's all sorts of things that you can do. But once you start building a community of artists and meeting the artists that are in these groups or however you're meeting artists, they also like, you know, will tell you about things that they're doing. And so you just, you hear about more and you're connected more. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really helpful. Yeah, what I see about you is that you, you do a lot of outreach yourself. You're not waiting for someone to stop by and discover you, right? You, you are doing your yeah. own outreach. Yeah, my own, re I think my own research and my own outreach, mm -hmm. just seeing, um, where I can get my art out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing that a lot more, I think, in the beginning. And now that I've got, like, the past year I've spent working toward a, a show at one of the galleries. So I haven't been doing as much of that. But because I'm doing a show at the gallery, they're doing a little bit of marketing for on my behalf. So um, I think the more you do in the beginning, the more, uh, the wider a net you cast, I think the more helpful it will be as you establish your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How often do you get printed in the magazines? It used to be more um, because I was on top of like the, all the competitions, but um, a couple, t a couple, a year, a handful a year, I would say. I think this okay. past year only two or three, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but. It's been more than that. that yeah. And you keep entering the competitions to get into, you know, to get an award and be published, right? That's yeah, less and less like, um, like I said, International Artist Magazine has a different themed competition every month. Mm -hmm. Colored Pencil Magazine has their big annual competition um, mm -hmm. every year. Um, and then like the, like the color pencil society of America has two exhibits that you can apply to and then win awards through American women artists. Uh, so it's not necessarily just through the magazines, but, um, like Southwest art has a competition every year. It's not just for Southwest artists. There's all sorts of, um, allied, uh, allied artists of America. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So finding all those different ones and seeing which one you work might fit into. Um, but yeah, I've, like this year I've been doing less of the competitions because I've been more focused on just like producing um, the work. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you're having a solo show now, right? Yes, in a couple of weeks, it's gonna open uh, at Meyer Gallery in, in Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Yeah. How, how long is the so like is it for a month that one's for two weeks two yes. weeks yeah and and um, how how many pieces do you need to have in a show i have 13 for that um so i usually produce around like between like 12 and 15 a year just kind of depending on what i'm doing so for this show i have 13. okay and what what's the size of your work um it sort of varies but um i'd say generally like uh 18 by 22 or something, you know, not, not terribly big, but. Uh, yeah, but the, it's still, it's still very big for colored pencil work because it takes forever. <laughs> yeah. There's some that there's one that's like nine by nine that's smaller and there's a few that are larger, but somewhere within that. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I want to go back to your <laughs> technique. Uh, yeah. what's, uh, what's the surface um, that you work on? What kind of paper do you use? Um, so it's the Canson Mitans Touch Sanded Pastel Paper. Okay. Um, and so it, it's a little different than pastel matte, um, but it, it does have like a fine grit sandpaper texture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a, it's a thick watercolor paper that's been treated with the, um, the sanded uh, like coating on top. And they come in, I don't know, like 24 different colors. Mm -hmm. So I usually choose a mid-tone, like a grayish blue or something in the middle so that my whites can stand out, but it's not so hard to fill in the blacks, mm -hmm. you know, in the dark areas. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I used to use that paper. Yeah, but I, uh, I, I found the texture to be a little bit too much for, for my liking. It can be limiting, um, especially yeah. if you have something with a lot of detail, or if you're not wor if you're working small, mm -hmm. it, so you have to keep your pencil really sharp and to mm -hmm. um, so to get crisp lines and fine details, it does take a little extra effort. And so, if I'm doing something that really has a lot of detail or is super small, I'll do I'll use um, Rising Museum Board by Legion. Huh, I've never heard of that one. Yeah, they use it a lot in framing. They use it as a mat board. Um, oh, okay. So you find it in that section, but it's smooth to the touch, but it has enough grip to be able to hold mm -hmm. a lot of layers of pencil still. And it can handle like the pastel, um, the uh, pan pastel that I use. It's a I great, see. yeah, it's a great one to try. Is it white or it? Yeah, it they has... have warm white, cool white. I think oh, okay. antique white, and then they have a few grays, and they have a black as well. Um, mm -hmm. Although when I'm when I'm doing things with a black background, I still do a white or a gray paper, and then I just fill in the black with pastel because I found that working on an actual black paper, the whites don't pop as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard unless you use a fixative and then layer more white. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really helps, like giving a coat, yeah. waiting, waiting for it to dry, and then you can just draw over it and it becomes a lot brighter. Oh, fun. Mm -hmm. Like a workable fixative. Is that what you mean? Um, I, I use final fixative. It just, uh, I give it a light coat. I don't like spray it too much. Uh -huh. And that, yeah, it helps a lot. Nice. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> um, so I I find that your technique is kind of similar to mine because I I like to draw on colored surfaces as opposed to drawing on white. Yeah. So tell me why you prefer working on colored paper. I think I usually try to choose. Um, I base the color on the drawing. So something that will work as like a, under, a color underneath the pencil in certain areas, although most of it ends up getting covered 100%. Mm -hmm. um, but I often use watercolor to cover up the paper in the darker areas, especially just so that I don't have to do, especially mm -hmm. with the standard pastel paper, it takes a long time to fill in all those grooves and using mm -hmm. watercolor just eliminates that whole like process of filling in all the grooves of the paper and then you can just go on top with the colored pencil and do all the detail work but using um a toned paper rather than white it's just kind of gives me a middle ground so that i can build whites that will pop mm -hmm. but again like i don't have to work so hard to get the darks and then the middle values i'm just sort of um working on color instead of like filling in the white to get mm -hmm. to that middle value yeah yeah yeah, and also the colors react to that toned paper. They look so, they look vibrant. As they look to... much more vibrant. Yeah. 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 And I always have a color chart depending on what paper I'm working on. So that because um, a, a certain blue on white will look completely different on mm -hmm. like a gray or, a, you know, toned paper. So, mm -hmm. what, what kind of watercolors, uh, watercolor do you use? I either use, I have a, um, a little small set of Sennelier watercolors uh -huh. or I'll use watercolor pencils. So I have the Caran d'Ache watercolor pencils mm -hmm. and 
um, most, oops, sorry, uh, mostly Karen Dosh. Okay. Pen, yeah, I was trying to think of another. Why do you, why do you prefer that brand? I don't know watercolors very well. And so when I'm, especially when I'm trying to like teach someone, I just say, you know, you're probably better at watercolor than I am. So it's just, I love the Karen Dosh um, luminance line. It's like mm -hmm. my favorite line for yeah. colors. Yeah. And a lot of the colors translate to the watercolor and I just like the consistency of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think it's that I'm attached to them. It's just what I bought and what I have and it works. So yeah, I, <laughs> I also really... love luminance. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's just buttery and vibrant. Yeah, yeah the best. Um, mm -hmm. but I really just use the watercolor as a base layer. I'm not a very good watercolor artist because it gets completely covered with covered uh, with colored pencil afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I'm not super attached to any specific brand or method or anything with the watercolors. I see. If you're interested in visionary art or would like to take a video art course, please visit veronicasart.com. How do you make your backgrounds black? Like what kind of mix do you use? Because you don't use black paper, of course, so you mix the color. Uh, I just use black pa pan pastel. Um, oh, you use black? Yeah. Okay. And a lot of layering to get it to be completely black um, mm -hmm. or smushing the pastel into the paper. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I rarely use black with colored pencil work because I think there's more, uh, you can create a really dark black looking um, mm -hmm. with, with different colors. Um, mm -hmm. But with the pan pastel, it just, it's really black and it, uh, it, it does the trick. <laughs> I see. Yeah. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> How did you learn your, you know, your drawings are very realistic? I think I, uh, when I started doing colored pencil, I already had a great base, like a foundation um, for drawing. I think I was already had enough skill in actually drawing things in black and white. And so in college, you mean you got in college? Lucky. Yeah, and I've been drawing forever. It's uh, I've always loved oh, to draw. So okay. you know, just. Um, you know, first learning how to see, like look at an object and instead of drawing what you think it looks like, actually look at what it looks like because every that's what mm -hmm. makes everything so distinctive and interesting is if you're drawing an apple, you know, you know how to draw the shape of an apple with a little stem and a leaf. But what makes apples interesting is if you look at an individual apple and draw the curves of that apple and look at the colors and what's happening with the leaf, does it have, you know, all that. So I, I had already um, been working on that when I discovered colored pencils. So uh, it was more about figuring out how to maneuver the pencil because I wasn't used to using something with wax in it. Mm -hmm. So the first colored pencil drawing I did, I chose the wrong paper and I think I had too much pressure. And so the paper built up with so much wax that all of the color actually started chipping off the paper. Oh, yeah. 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 And so I thought, okay, well, that didn't work. And so it was sort of a trial and error process um, of figuring out how to, what paper to use, first of all, which is when I discovered the sanded paper. Mm -hmm. And then also um, like how to apply the pencil. So I do a lot of light layers rather than like having a heavy hand and burnishing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's just sort of the technique that I developed from trial and error and figuring out like, wow, this really mm -hmm. doesn't work or this, this works well to build color and vibrancy and depth. Some people are very heavy handed and it, it takes time to figure out who you are. <laughs> exactly. And I know yeah. like Heather Rooney is, a, you know, she does, mm -hmm. I, I've seen a few of her like videos and she has a really heavy hand and her work is gorgeous. And that's yeah. the cool thing about color pencil. Yeah. Like she pushes it. Yeah. 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 And you can do really any, like, any technique you do, you can get an amazing result with colored pencil. You just gotta, like you're saying, you have to find what works for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what do you do for blending, for blending colored pencil? I know you don't blend the pastels, I'm assuming, because you use the sponge. Yeah, I use the sponge for the pastels. Um, um, for blending, yeah. I just, I don't use any sort of uh, like blender or mm -hmm. um, 
I just blend the the colors together through light and even layers. Mm -hmm. um, for blending colors, I um, I generally just work with light layers and I make sure that the application is smooth of a color. Um, and then if I'm like trying to create a gradient, I um, blend two colors together without using a blending stick or any kind of um, blending tool, just uh, working with the two colors and applying them directly to the paper. So just lots of light layers is how mm -hmm. I blend, yeah. I find that colored pencil blends well when the surface is right. And if your layering is tight, then it just blends on its own. But if paper has a lot of texture, uh, you kind of have to use a to use a blender or a gamzol or something else to to blend. Yeah, I've tried using mineral spirits. Mm -hmm. um, it has a really the way I was using it, it came off like really painterly. That's how my mm -hmm. looks. Yeah, which is fun. Um, I need to do a little more experimentation because you know after a while I, you you get settled into one technique and there's mm -hmm. so many things you can do with colored pencils. So, um, but yeah, right now I'm just doing the and the um, sanded paper does have a lot of texture, so it takes a lot of effort, mm -hmm. like it takes a lot of layers to get yeah. the blend right. But um, but that's just kind of what I've got f fallen into because I've gotten so used to it. That's wow. the, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you have a lot of patience. I'm amazed because I, I would be, I don't know, whenever I work on textured paper, it drives me nuts. It takes a long time, yeah. But mm -hmm. there's something special about the final effect of, you know, like if I'm working on a smooth paper, um, you can see the wax build up a lot more. So the, the mm -hmm. um, final drawing looks a little bit shiny in some areas mm -hmm. and not in others. Whereas on the sanded pastel paper, I don't get a lot of that shine and you can kind of see that tech, that speckled texture of the paper through and there's something sort of unique about it. So that's why I push through those um, moments of getting frustrated that it's taking so long to get mm -hmm. to the final result. Yeah. <laughs> and you are using luminance exclusively. Do you use any other color pencils? I use Prismacolor as well, Prismacolor mm -hmm. Premieres, but um, mm -hmm. I've checked the light fast workbook that uh, the CPSA puts out and I've mm -hmm. taken out all of those pencils that rate really yeah. low on the, on the scale. Yeah. Um, and then I've also started using, I only have a few of them, but the Derwent light fast, um, mm -hmm. especially pinks and purples are tough because a lot of them are not light fast. And so mm -hmm. Prismacolor, you only end up with like two or three pinks and purples once you take mm -hmm. out all the low rated mm -hmm. light fast pencils. And um, Derwent light fast has a few of those. So I use, I have a couple, um, mm -hmm. but mostly the luminance, I love them, yeah. 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 It's interesting that <laughs> we get the consensus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah they're good quality. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to share something specific about your technique that I might not ask you about? Like, do you have? Yeah, I think um, discovering the watercolor using watercolor underneath is really fun because sometimes like if I'm doing a tulip stem or something that has a little bit of yellow in it but it's actually a green sometimes mm -hmm. I'll use just like a straight yellow watercolor so, and let that show through the green of the pencil um, so it's fun to um, kind of play with color in that way because the watercolor goes on so quickly and um, I don't make it necessarily uh, like it's not like a gouache where it's opaque, but I put enough color on that it fills in all those grooves and then mm -hmm. to work on top of that and already have kind of a fun color underneath that can show through your drawing mm -hmm. is really helpful. And um, like I've already said, sort of working with the watercolor in those dark areas to eliminate the process of having to just like fill in the paper before you actually mm -hmm. add any detail is really helpful. Do you use watercolor on that pastel paper? Yeah, it goes on really well. Oh, wow. Um, very easily. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll do the first, I'll do the um, pan pastel with a frisket film, and then I'll peel off the frisket film and go in with watercolor, being really careful not to drag the pastel into the watercolor area. Uh, and then once the watercolor is dried, I'll go on top with colored pencil. And I think you can do it the opposite way. You can probably do your watercolor and pencil first and then do pastel mm -hmm. at the end. But um, 
I, I need, if, especially if I'm working with a dark background, I need to have the reference of the dark background to get mm -hmm. my values correct, you, you know? Um, so it's helpful for me to do it that way first, but it does, I do need to be careful about not dragging the pastel into the drawing. Mm -hmm. Do you stretch paper to do the watercolor or you just apply it with a little bit of water? So yeah, little... just a little bit of water. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, it depends how much water you use. Cause... Oh yeah, it can, um, and depends which paper you're using too, yeah. but it's, um, because I think the, the Canson paper is a watercolor paper that's then treated. It's so thick and it's so mm -hmm. durable that it works mm -hmm. well for watercolor pencils or watercolor. Yeah. The, the thicker the paper, the better the result. And it's yeah. so much easier to work on thick paper. Oh, for sure. And the, yeah. actually the rising museum board, it comes in two ply, four ply and eight ply. So the eight ply is almost like a, an actual board, um, mm -hmm. which is fun, fun to work with. Yeah. Which, which one do you use? Eight or four? I usually choose four because um, I don't find the eight to be necessary and it's easier to cut, you know, and get smooth mm -hmm. edges. Um, but if you, if you like to work on really thick, sturdy things, <laughs> the mm -hmm. eight ply is good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think framing gets easier too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think um, this isn't so much colored pencil technique, but a big part of my process is um, getting the image itself to work from. Like it took me a long time to realize how important a reference image is. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I used to work exclusively from life and now I have a son and I, ha I don't have consistent time in the studio and with colored pencil, and flowers, the drawing takes so long that the flower is completely dead by the time, I, you know, I would be done drawing. So I work from photos now. Um, but the benefit of that is being able to capture a moment of light and to be able to tinker with the actual arrangement until I get exactly what I want. And so I think mm -hmm. that's like half the battle is getting that perfect image to work from and then, you know, trans translating that into a drawing. Well, share how, how you arrange your photo shoot. Like, what do you do? Yeah, usually um, I'll do a few, uh, I'll try to get a few images done in one photo shoot, so like enough for a couple of drawings. So I'll go to the San Francisco flower market, which is this huge um, building of all of the growers in the area. And so they have every flower that you could possibly want. And I'll gather, sometimes I have something specific in mind, like, oh, I definitely want to do a peony or I need something that's um, like jasmine, that's gonna be like a long, like not super floral, just little buds of something. Um, like I might have a vase in mind with sort of a um, shape of an arrangement rather than mm -hmm. the specific flowers and then I'll go and look for them or sometimes I have nothing at all and I just want to be inspired when I get there and I'll choose some things and I bring them home and I have um, a huge collection of vases that I'll choose from or sometimes I don't even use a vase at all depending on the flower that I got I'll just have the flower with a background um, and then during the photo shoot I just use mat board so I have like white black and gray mat board that I can use as a background um, and I always use natural lighting. So I'll set up in front of uh, a window in my house, depending on what time of day it is, I'll move around mm -hmm. the house. And um, I'll just try things like, um, say I've gotten, uh, yeah, a peony. I'll try it in a certain vase with a certain lighting. And if I capture that on the first go, that's great. But I'll also try it in a different vase or in a different room at a like another time of day to change to like alter the lighting so my photo shoots last throughout the whole day and I take hundreds of photos and then the next day I'll kind of go through the photos and choose which ones will turn into drawings which ones were successful or not and then sometimes I watch the flowers like sometimes the flowers open up really beautifully after two days or something like that and so I'll do another shoot with the flower at a different stage of life um, but it's kind of a long process, which is why I try to get a couple drawings out of one photo shoot. How do you make your orchids look suspended? Like, how do you shoot that picture? Yeah, so that one, I took the orchids out of the pot and sort of washed off the roots. And then I, my husband's a chef, so he's got a lot of uh, like butcher's twine. 
So I just used the twine and tied it to um, the stem of the orchid and then taped that twine to the ceiling. So it was hanging. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of rotated it to see what angle I wanted to draw. And then had a few more pieces of string that I like tied one piece to the window and one piece to the, the mat board so that I could get it um, hanging and still exactly at the angle that I wanted it. And then I did the photo shoot and just didn't include the string in the I drawing. See. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's very creative. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, very creative. I don't know how you came up with this idea, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, well, the orchids, I was trying to think of a, I don't love orchids. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're super interesting. I, there's not a flower that I loved. And I wanted to find a way to draw them and represent them where I could love them. And I discovered that they had these intricate, amazing, like tubular roots. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I want to be able to show the roots, but I didn't want them to be compressed against a table. So I thought, okay, I'm going to hang it so that you can see all of the roots and all of the flower. And mm -hmm. that's how I came up with that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things what I like about your art is that you show a very unusual position of a flower. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I haven't, I, will, I didn't mean to become a botanical artist, but um, because I fell in love with flowers, I do look for different ways to represent them, I think, just to keep it interesting and fun and keep myself learning. How, how do you organize your color? Do you plan your color scheme ahead of time? Or let's say you look at your flower and you decide what colors you're going to use? Like, tell me more about that. I um, generally, I'll try to, so I build my drawing all at the same time. So I don't like work on one petal and finish it and then move to the next petal. Um, and so the, with the base layers, I'll just, if it's, you know, a pink flower, I'll choose um, like one or two colors for the, like the darker shadow area and mm -hmm. one or two colors for the highlighted area. Um, and I'll keep it pretty simple and cover the whole thing um, just so that I can lay out the flower and get the drawing mm -hmm. sort of established. And then as I go on top, it's another reason I actually have Come to love working from a photo is I can really zoom in on the photo to a petal and see like every petal has you know 12 different colors in it so there's a little bit of orange and there's a little bit of blue even though it's pink you know depending mm -hmm. on where you look in the petal and so when I'm doing the detailed layered work I'll just kind of zoom in and, and I guess I sort of wing it I don't I don't have a prepared like um blending chart on the side I just choose colors and see what works and go from there. How do you choose your colors for the underpainting? I think I look, um, so for that, I'll zoom out of the drawing and just look at it uh, as a whole, like what, um, what are the predominant colors? And they're more based on the value than the actual color. So I'm more looking for like, like sometimes for just sticking with the pink flower in the shadowed areas, I'll use a dark blue. Like I think 639 is a um, luminance, really super dark blue. <laughs> and so I use that often in the shadow areas as a base. Um, I see. Yeah. Your process seems very similar to mine, believe it or um, not. That's yeah. how I, I approach drawing. Oh, that's great. Yeah, having like just one or two colors to do the underpainting. And, yeah, it's helpful because especially with realism, it's so easy to get hyper-focused on one area mm -hmm. and then the drawing as a whole doesn't really come together. So mm -hmm. for me, building the drawing as a whole and having a sort of underpainting is really helpful to keep in mind. It's not just about the one petal, it's about the flower and then mm -hmm. as you zoom in, the one petal can be really interesting. But if you have a whole bunch of really interesting individual petals that you didn't build as a flower altogether, it doesn't always work. So mm -hmm. doing it in that way um, helps helps yeah. my mind do that. Yeah, I think it gives uh, it gives unity to the piece. Exactly. Like, yeah. Huh. 
interesting that <laughs> your process is so similar I mean, be, be, besides using the pen pastels yeah um, you know i'd like to ask for your advice like what do you think artists should be doing um, to be successful in art i think the first thing is doing something that you really love because um, once you do become a professional artist, um, you do kind of have to produce. So you better make sure whatever you're making is something that you can continually find inspiration in. Um, and then in terms of like the business, yeah, really making sure that you're marketing, that you're meeting other artists, that you're going to gallery openings, that you're, um, continually experimenting and pushing the bounds of your medium, um, and then having a, a beautiful website and getting really good images of your art is super important. If you have a good image, you know, first of all, you can display it online, but also you can make prints of your work. And that's another good way, especially if you're a colored pencil artist, usually those drawings take a long time. And so mm -hmm. production might be low over a year, but if you sell prints while you're making originals, that's a good way like financially to kind of keep things going or cards or something like that. Um, yeah, so I think making connections, um, having an online presence, it was really important. And then um, getting yourself published uh, is also very helpful because it helps with your visibility um, and it's something to add to your website. I think that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Belonging to the organizations that will connect you with other artists and that will kind of keep you inspired and keep you motivated to produce. That's a, a great thing to do as well. I think there is a, a little bit of misunderstanding why artists need the website. Usually uh, um, they think that while well, I put my art there and then it gets, you know, sold out. But I think the reason for having a website is to establish your authority and presence and have a portfolio. Exactly. Well, what, what, what do you think uh, the website should have? Uh, for a website, you definitely want a portfolio and mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to put everything you've ever made on there. You can curate it so that um, mm -hmm. just choose the best things. Like I think it's better to keep your portfolio small with uh, the best representation of what you do rather than having everything on there with some things not, you know, maybe are they're just sketches or they don't relate to what you're currently doing. So having a concise portfolio with high quality images um, having a page that um, with like your, if you're going to do exhibits, like even if it's a group exhibit with the CPSA or a solo exhibit or um, publications, anything you've been published in so that people that are coming to your page can see like, oh, this is a professional artist. They've been published. Mm -hmm. They've, you know, they're active um, in being involved in the art community. Um, I'm trying to think of what I have on my website. Uh, like if you having a shop online where people can just go online and purchase them rather than having to see them like in person that you'll reach a broader audience that way and then making sure that you have your um, social media linked to your website so that people can check and see like see the behind the scenes things or like how many follows you, followers you have that kind of does help to um, establish your presence I think mm -hmm. yeah and yeah, then a contact good. page, of course, yeah. <laughs> so that they, people can contact you. But I think a website does help um, give a professional appearance, you know, to your work. So if, if somebody likes your work and then they want to learn more about you. So that's another thing is having an about page with your artist statement mm -hmm. and a little bit about your background and a little bit about like why you do what you do is really helpful. Yeah, very good. <laughs> it's a good summary. <laughs> Thank you for yeah, sharing thanks. that. Of course. Yeah. Um, what camera do you use? Uh, I, I'm assuming you do your own photography of your art. Actually, I use a scanner. Um, you use a scanner? Yeah, okay. I used to do photography, but because um, pencil work has a sheen, you know, with the wax mm -hmm. 
it can be hard to capture that on a camera. You can get a glare mm -hmm. uh, where the sheen is. And so using, I have an Epson expression. It's a 10,000 XL, which is like a big um, professional quality scanner. And it was- So what's the, uh, the size of it? Like you, you said your art is pretty big. Does it fit? Yeah, so it's about, this scanner is like, I'm measuring it right now, like 22 by 15 or something like that. But the great thing about this scanner is the top lifts off. So I did a piece that was like 33 by 44 inches. It was huge. Okay. And I just scanned it in sections. And then you can use Photoshop to mm -hmm. photo merge. Um, and Photoshop has like an auto feature where they'll seamlessly photo merge if you have enough information in each of the segments of your scans, they can merge it together. And so with this scanner, the lid completely comes off so that I can have a huge piece of paper. In this case, it was on the Rising Museum board. So it was just a mm -hmm. board that I laid on top of the scanner and took separate images and then photo merged. So you were asking about artists and marketing and all those things. Um, being able to use Photoshop is a huge, mm -hmm. just like learning the basics of Photoshop can be mm -hmm. really, really helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I also use Photoshop. I have a different scanner. I think it's not that big. And I find that when I scan the image and, you know, I, I do move it around because it's big, um, the, uh, the edges get a different color, so it's difficult to merge it together. But I use Photoshop Elements. I don't have the full version of. Photoshop. Oh, okay. It might be this. It might be the scanner, um, mm -hmm. or it might be that your image is not like if it's on the edges that your image is not completely flat against mm -hmm. the uh, bed. So the other thing about this scanner is the bed of the scanner is completely flush with the edges. So there's no lip. So if you if your scanner has a lip, it means that the paper is lifted off just enough. Yeah, to yeah, that's what it is. So that's why I'm asking because uh, yeah, it makes I, a difference. I, yeah. I did a lot of research when I was getting the scanner because mm -hmm. having good images is so important to me. And so it had to have yeah, no lip and a lid that lifts, and then a pretty. This one has a pretty big scan scanning surface to begin with, um, and the color accuracy is amazing. So. Mm -hmm. it, so what what's the name of the of the brand? It's F, uh, Epson Expression 10,000 XL. So it's not like the latest. They've made other scanners since then. And I actually I got mine used um, on like eBay or something mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I didn't need it to be brand new. And I've had it for several years. And it's oh uh, yeah, it lasts forever. It yeah, lasts but... forever. You can replace mm -hmm. the glass if it gets scratched. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just use it forever. So. <laughs> It's, mm -hmm. I would recommend it. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's oh, very course. useful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we quit? Um, I, I think we covered, yeah, I think we pretty much covered it. I, it was so fun to talk to you and talk to <laughs> and pencils. And um, if you have questions, you know, or anyone has questions, they can feel free to contact me through my website. I'm always happy to share. Mm -hmm. So tell your uh, tell the name of your website, please, and your Instagram or whatever other social media that you use so people can find you. Yeah, so my website is just my name. So it's MeganSider.com. Um, and then my Instagram is MS underscore fine art. Um, and that's the main I'm, I have Facebook as well, but I'm not I mostly post all of my stuff to Instagram. So those are the mm -hmm. two places that I'm really active. And you can find my email on my website or you can contact me directly through the, the website if you have questions. Very good. I think uh, a lot of people left uh, Facebook <laughs> a while yeah. back. Yeah, I mean, it was the big thing for a while and then all these other uh, social media platforms have popped up. But I know there's still a lot of people on Facebook, so I do try mm -hmm. to post every once in a while, but I'm not quite as active. On well, I'd like to thank you for sharing your talent with us. It's very exciting. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Megan, and have a beautiful day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Take care. Bye-bye.